Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and many thanks for joining me for my presentation on uh, misunderstood insects or rethinking pests, why we should love wasps. Uh, I first gave this presentation at the Wildlife Arts Festival in Otley last year. And when I was asked to do it for Yorkshire Rewilding, I thought I'd broaden my PR campaign, so wave a flag for some of the other most hated insects. So I'm hoping that within about 30 minutes, I can help the wasp and fly haters amongst you to at least uh, see them in a slightly more appreciative light. So wasps, they're very dear to my heart. Um, the first half of my talk will be all about wasps and I'll concentrate on these because they've been my study subject for many years. Uh, in the second half, I'll move on to everybody's favourite, which are the flies, uh, just to look, uh, give a broader overview of what flies have ever done for us. But like I say, wasps are very dear to my heart. Uh, they kick-started my career in ecology about 20 years ago. And when I started in research, uh, I looked at how wasps can help us to find clues as to the evolution of social behaviour. So in the animal kingdom, there aren't many that have evolved the heights of social living that the wasp bee, bees and ants have achieved. So first, we're going to talk about what a wasp actually is, uh, the diversity of their forms and their behaviour, which will lead us on to looking at how amazing they are in terms of their looks um, and for the more cynical amongst you, uh, a look at their economic value. So what is a wasp? Well, this is a diagram of the basic wasp form. Uh, you can see it has a very narrow wasp waist or uh, what's called a petiole. Bees and ants have uh, very similar forms, but we'll see that they're actually very closely related. So many bees could almost be described as hairy vegan wasps. So just to illustrate the public attitude towards wasps, whilst I was looking for this very useful diagram, I came across some similar ones, which are not exactly very family friendly. Uh, this is uh, an illustration of what you'll find if you look up wasps on the internet, which I think is very unfair. Um, yeah, they are not well liked. So let's move swiftly on. So wasps have been here for millions of years and they've evolved many forms and behaviours. Uh, during the time of the dino dinosaurs in the Jurassic, there was an ancestral form of Hymenoptera. And broadly, this is the order of insects, which includes the wasps, bees, ants and sawflies. These early insects would have been solitary uh, protein eaters. This ancestral form gradually diversified into 13 superfamilies, and bees eventually evolved within one of these superfamilies about 130 million years ago in the Cretaceous, when a wasp became a vegan. So instead of supplying its young with meat protein, it discovered that pollen protein could equally work. So since that time, bees and flowers which also appeared in the Cretaceous, have diversified with each other, with bees evolving to become hairier and therefore more effective and efficient at collecting pollen. There is one group of bees that buck the trend, which are the vampire bees. Uh, they actually feed on carcasses. Um, and to confuse matters even more, because nature doesn't like a simple rule, ghoul wasps are vegetarian, but that's a whole other story we'll get onto later. So within the Apoidea superfamily, we have about 700 uh, existing speckled wasps and we have 20,000 species of bee. So you can see here that the uh, bees are very diverse in their form and their behavior, but I'm going to blow that figure for bee diversity out of the water now by looking at wasp diversity. So there are 13 superfamilies of the Apocrita, and that's the Hymenoptera family minus the sawflies. Uh, within the Apoidea, we have the bees, and within the Vespoidea, we have the ants. 
Uh, if you look at the existing number of wasp species alone for each superfamily, we get some massive numbers. If we put that all together, we end up with more than 100,000 species, which is probably a vast underestimate as well. Uh, they are the most diverse group of insects on the planet. So there's over 7,000 wasp species in the UK. Uh, we have the social wasps, such as the common and the German wasps. Um, we have the gentle giants, such as the hornet. We have digger wasps, uh, such as the ammophila, and we have parasitoids, uh, such as the giant wood wasp. And here in the centre, we have gastroeruption uh, jaculator, which uh, uses this enormous ovipositor for egg laying. So with so many different species, we have a vast amount of forms and behaviours. Uh, these are some wasps that I coloured with Airfix paint. Um, we'll get on to why I did that, but um, I think they look good. So most of the super families we've just looked at consist of parasitoid wasps. Um, there are about 6,500 species in the UK of parasitoid wasp, and most of them are from the Ichneumoni. Pneumonidae family. Um, that name comes from the ancient Greek for tracker, which uh, kind of reveals something about their um, amazing uh, hunting skills. So parasitoids are solitary wasps and their off offspring live off uh, other organisms. Parasitoid wasps can inject their eggs into something like a caterpillar, like you can see in the picture here, and the emerging larvae will feed off the caterpillar's blood or uh, what's called the hemolymph uh, before finally killing the host by bursting out of the skin. Sorry, that's a bit Halloween-y. Um, there are also hyperparasitoid wasps that lay their eggs into parasitoid larvae. And there's even hyper hyperparasitoid wasps that keep the chain going for even longer. So other parasitoids we have are called kleptoparasites, and they will lay their eggs near a host's egg, which uh, hatch before the host eggs do, and they'll eat all the food that has been supplied to that host. And then sometimes they'll eat the eggs and the larvae if they're still peckish. Um, there are many other forms of parasitism you might want to look at if you're feeling that way inclined. But just to mention my favourite, here we have the beautiful wasp, uh, which is called the Crypt Keeper uh, or Uterus Set, uh, an absolutely beautiful wasp. Um, its behaviour is quite gruesome, um, so definitely one for after hours and uh, Google it later if you dare. So I realise admit admittedly none of this behaviour is particularly endearing, um, but parasitoid wasps do play a huge part in biological pest control. So just one example, this one millimeter long wasp is uh, Anagyrus lapesi. Um, it saved the cassava industry in Southeast Asia by controlling the cassava mealy bug. Um, so it stopped the farmers resorting to pesticides. Um, it curbed tropical deforestation. Uh, it brought the crops production back to its original yield and stopped them spreading out into the uh, neighbouring rainforest. So hopefully this will work. Um, but to illustrate, some parasitoids are extremely beautiful. Um, we're going to have a look at the Chrysid cuckoo wasp now and hopefully I can get this video to work. So Chrysid cuckoo wasps, um, some of them are UK resident. And this is just a little video showing uh, some hunting behavior.
Okay, so now this is her hunting behavior. She's using her antennae to try and pick up the scent of her host. She's a kleptoparasite, so as soon as she finds the nest of her host, which is a, a mining bee, she's going to deposit her own eggs next to it. Other behaviours uh, come from digger wasps, which are solitary wasps that create a nest in the ground. Um, there's about 100, uh, over 100 species in the UK, and they provision their young with insects. Um, the picture here shows the ornate tailed digger wasp. Um, this is Cerceris ribaensis, and she's taking a bee back to her nest. Uh, we have Ammophila pubescens here. Uh, she is often found on heathland and she's bringing back caterpillar prey. Um, and also we have not a UK species, but included because it's pretty amazing, is the tarantula hawk. And she's actually brought a tarantula back to her nest, which is pretty uh, good going. Ghoul wasps show another form of behaviour, so um, this is one for the vegetarians. These tiny wasps lay their eggs in plants, which respond by forming these ghouls. Uh, there are 86 species of ghoul wasp in the UK. The wasp larvae actually live off the internal lining of that ghoul, and there are many forms, mostly uh, they are on oak. Uh, these are a great thing to look out for if you're on a woodland walk. And if you are particularly uh, keen to get into this, there is all, even a British plant gall society. So we've got oak apple galls here. Um, we have some nopla galls and uh, some spangle galls. They're all caused by different species um, and they usually have little impact on their host plant. So we've seen there are many types of behaviour that the solitary wasps display, but how did we get from to the large social wasp colonies that, um, that we're all familiar with today? When many of us think of wasps, we think of this large common wasp nest here. And this fault colony is founded by a queen and she lays eggs and they develop into um, female workers and males. So how did we eventually arrive at this system? I'm just going to give you a whistle stop tour of a huge body of research I was involved in. But basically, some of these wasps are facultatively eusocial. What does that mean? Well, this is the hairy faced hover wasp, Leostenogaster flavolineata, a bit of a, a mouthful. The females of this species on the nest, they can all lay eggs, uh, but actually only one does, um, the queen if you like, but in terms of these insects we call her the foundress. Um, she's actually no physiologically different to the other females on the nest, they, they're all capable of laying eggs, um, so she's no different to her sisters or her daughters. So why do any of the females actually stick around to help the foundress to rear her eggs and not just go and form their own nest. So there are a few reasons, not least because forming your own nest is actually very hard and it involves a lot of legwork and uh, to get that established. But one reason is because there is a special situation for the Hymenoptera, the bees, wasps and the ants in which they share more of their genes with their siblings than they do, um, than we do, would with ours. So that's 75% of their genetic material compared with 50% because the situation is that the males arise from unfertilized eggs and therefore share uh, all of their genes with their mother. Um, so I won't get bogged down in the details, but actually helping to raise their siblings has more genetic benefits um, than for other non-hymenopterans. So in the case of this wasp, which is the hairy faced hover wasp, um, there is actually the additional benefit of sticking around um, on the nest because the oldest on the nest eventually inherits the egg laying dominant position. Finding out that the oldest on the nest inherits was a huge uh, body of research um, and it involved um, 
monitoring hundreds of wasps throughout their lives. And that's why each of these is given an individual mark um, because they are basically monitored so that the exact age of each of the wasps is known. Um, and so this involved monitoring each of the wasp nests in the dark um, when you can guarantee that all the wasps will be on the nest. So basically I lived in, pretty much lived in a tunnel for a couple of years. And this is what you can expect also in Malaysian tunnels. Um, I did have a lot of the friends to keep me company. This particular big scorpion there called Jamie. Um, I did go a little bit mad out there. So you can see I've had a close relationship with wasps for a while, and that's one reason why I love them. But the other reason is we actually have a lot of things in common. Wasps have close family values and they love a picnic. So one common reason wasps are not liked is that our interests actually overlap a little bit too much. Wasps invading your picnic are looking for two things. They're looking for meat or sugar. So social wasps need to find meat or protein for the larvae back at the nest. So your piece of steak is a temptingly very easy option. I'm often considered a bit mad, but at a picnic, I'll often put a, pe a small piece of meat aside uh, for the wasps, just to let them do their own thing and carve it out and take it back to the nest. I find that's quite harmonious and I've never been stung by a British wasp. Um, so when returning with that food, uh, the young, so they return to the um, wasp nest with their, this protein, the larvae excrete a sugary substance uh, for the workers in, as a reward. Uh, the problem arises when there are no more larvae at the nest and that's so at the end of the lifespan of the nest. Workers then have to get a sugary fix from somewhere else and that's likely to be from rotting fruit or your ice cream or a bin. So my advice is don't hang around bins in late summer because you'll probably fall foul of some boozy wasps um, that have overdone it on like fermented sugars. So the wasps at your picnic are either being attentive, caring older sisters um, to the young back of the nest or they're just, um, just really hungry. Other reasons to love wasps, quite simply, they are beautiful. So here we have a mason wasp, uh, top left, and we have the tarantula hawk that we saw a bit earlier. Uh, bottom left, we have a tiny parasitic wasp, wasp which has a, like, amazing, beautiful antennae. And then towards the center, we've got some of the chrysid jeweled wasps. Uh, and then we've got two of the calcid wasps over on the right. Uh, calcid. The name derives from the Greek, which means copper, um, because as you can see, they've got amazing metallic colors. Wasp nests are also amazingly beautiful and they can be quite elaborate and they're derived from paper, uh, derived from wood pulp and from mud. Well, in the corner here, we have Polistes paper wasps, uh, which are actually so clever that they can recognize each other from their facial patterns. So hopefully I've shown that wasps are diverse, beautiful, intelligent and caring. Um, what else can we say? Well, if we want to look at it in stark economic terms, wasps also deliver in a massive way. So Wasps are the gardener's friend. They eat about 14 million tons of insect biomass per year. Uh, they help with aphids, caterpillars, weevils, um, much more. They use the biocontrol. So as I mentioned briefly before, parasitoid wasps are one of the most effective tool in biocontrol of pest species. They're worth at least $416 billion per year. Uh, wasps actually are very useful for pollination services. So uh, bees are great pollinators and they've adapted to be basically become the, flower, the flower's friend. 
but wasps are carrying out pollination from the very beginning. When wasps are hunting or feeding themselves with nectar, they get covered with pollen, um, which they help disperse. So there's 164 species of plant which are completely dependent on wasps for pollination, and such as orchids and figs. Seed dispersal, um, otherwise known as vespicocori, um, wasp-mediated seed dispersal, uh, is reported between 10 plant species and 12 social wasp species. They're also important for decomposition and nutrient cycling, playing an important role in breaking down carcasses. They are important biological indicators. Um, so measures of wasp diversity can also be a good indicator of overall biodiversity. There's even some evidence that the degree of melanization, so uh, darkness um, of some vespular facial markings is influenced by levels of heavy, heavy metals. So um, provides a direct indicator of those pollutants. 109 wasp species are eaten by humans across 19 countries, most commonly in their larval form. Wasps are popular street food in East Asia, uh, Africa, South America, and several wasp groups also produce honey. And if all of that is not yet enough to win you over, uh, there's the fact that the venom of some wasps is currently being investigated um, for cancer treatment. So hopefully I've made a compelling case for wasps. So I'll now move on to flies for a brief overview, which you might be pleased to hear. Um, flies. Flies are aptly named because they are uh, supreme flyers. What helps them with uh, their flying ability is the presence of what we call haltiers which are modified wings, which effectively act as a gyroscope. Flies can undergo a complete metamorphosis from egg to larva to pupa to adult. And we have approximately 100,000 known species worldwide with 5,500 in the UK. The value of flies then, well, I've only got one thing to say, that's chocolate and I can just leave it there, case closed. Imagine a world without chocolate, it would be horrific. So flies are great pollinators. They can often reach the parts of plants that other insects can't. And that's why the cocoa tree relies on them so much. Um, it relies on tiny midges for pollination or four sipomyia midges, which there's one such example on this slide on the bottom. They're maximum three millimeters long, and they're one of the only insects which can actually access the tiny flowers of the cocoa tree. But it's not just chocolate, it's mangoes, uh, chili pepper, black pepper, carrot, fennel, onion. They all are, rely heavily on fly pollination. So sorry for some gruesome photos, but decomposition. So imagine a world where nothing ever broke down. We'd have piles of rotten meat and vegetables and nutrients would be locked up and unable to be released back to the environment. So for animal decomposition, we've all seen the first creatures to arrive at the wake are flies. Um, they help to break down corpses within a very short period of time. So without that, we'd be in a real mess. Plant decomposition. Well, plant cell walls are really difficult to digest and they're not readily broken down. So flies are needed to release their nutrients back to the environment. And let's also not forget that our friends, the cockroaches, play a similarly important role there. There's also dung consumption. That's a beautiful photo. Uh, there are 30 fly families that contain animal waste consumers and 13 of these, uh, that's their main food source. So the famous French entomologist Jean-Henri Faber, uh, he wrote, 
you think they are horrid, dirty insects, but they are not. They are busy making the world a cleaner place for you to live in. I think it's quite a nice statement. Animal feed then. So flies play their part as animal food. This here is the black soldier fly. Um, it is very popularly commercially bred now, which means that it's often referred to as BSF. They are very easy to breed. They develop quickly from egg to larva in just four days. And BSF factories have been set up worldwide. So alongside you, you might have your animal unit where you produce your animals. You might have your BSF factory set to the side of that and the BSF to, will consume the animal's waste and then the BSF maggots will pupate and you feed the pupa back to the animals. So it's quite a, a smart little system. Um, the use of BSF in animal feed just keeps on expanding and as a protein rich food source, um, it's going to be a really important player when we look towards sustainable global food demands. Pest control. So we've already covered what an important job wasps play in pest control and uh, flies contribute in a similar way. So one example is the control of the liver fluke and this is a parasite of cattle and it lives in its intermediate host which is the freshwater snail Limnaea olula. And it was a particular problem in Hawaii in the 1960s. So what was needed was the help of a snail killing fly and specifically the liver fluke snail predator fly, Cepidomerus macropus, which was from Central America and then introduced. But then they found that a two pronged approach was needed because Cepidomerus was very good at doing its thing when the snail was in water. But when the water body dried up, another snail killer was needed. So the European species Fabelia dorsata was then introduced. They actually did an incredibly successful job without impacting other native snail populations. And work is actually now being undertaken to investigate how snail killing flies might be used to control the grey garden slug. Moving on then to forensic entomology and medicine. Um, I haven't included any gruesome pictures with this because it's around tea time. Um, as we discussed, flies are one of the first to the feast when we die. And the timeline of flies which arrive at a corpse is pretty reliable. So we have different species specializing in consumption of different parts of the body and they um, are involved at different stages, different times in the stages of decomposition. So the species present and their position within the corpse can provide important clues to the time of death. With regards to medicine, for centuries maggots have been used to clean wounds. Uh, the process uh, most commonly uses the common green bottle, which we have uh, just here, which is Lucilia sericata, and they will eat away at rotten necrotic wounds. Uh, fear not, the maggots will only eat away at dead material, but you can actually get maggot bags. Um, so that keeps them contained within a bag, uh, but it's kind of mesh that allows their little jaws to poke through. Sorry for squeamish. Um, these maggots produce an, an antiseptic called allantoin, which uh, stimulates healing and with antibiotic resistance becoming such a, a serious problem, the medicinal properties of maggots are being seriously considered within medicinal research. So that's actually the last slide of my PR pitch for misunderstood insects. I hope you found my argument compelling and my case rests. Um, whilst uh, undeniably some insects can be pests, there are many that provide serious benefits, uh, even pest control. 
So in a world of uncertainty with climate change, food demands, antibiotic resistance, uh, pollinator decline, we can't really afford to demonize uh, what are our allies in these particular insects. So that has been a very quick tour of the world of misunderstood insects. But if you'd like to know more, I can recommend these four excellent books. There we go. Catherine, thank you. It's it's often said we shouldn't just uh, concentrate on the big species like the beavers and bears and stuff in rewilding, you know, the small stuff matters. But I think I've never been anywhere near that level of understanding or depth in, in why that is and, and what it is. So thank you ever so much for that. Um, I'd invite people, remind them to put any questions in the Q&A, please. Got a couple here already, um, but please ask any others. Um, and we'll uh, we'll work our way through those. Um, so, Catherine, uh, pest control certainly um, you know really relevant part of the of the benefit. Um, to what extent can that replace? You know, can it be effective enough to replace chemical pest control in agriculture or in gardens, or is it really around the edges? So there's a lot of research that's being conducted at the moment. There's a the European um, initiative to provide a strategy where um, basically pesticide-free agriculture. Um, so, I mean, whilst it's easy to reach for the glyphosate, we've all seen that that has uh, terrible um consequences for some insect populations particularly for bees so we've got this situation with neonicotinoids which are a chemical that can really mess around with the the neural networks of bees and uh, glyphosate similarly damaging so there is a real drive to move towards uh, kind of pest for pesticide free uh, agriculture and within your own garden mm. there are options for going pesticide free such as like companion planting and um, maybe kind of rotational cropping that kind of alternative so if you um, kind of look on the internet for for various pesticide alternatives there there are quite a lot out there and certainly I think that that wider balance that a wider landscape provides from wasps as well as song thrush um hedgehogs just let the system do it um, yeah we've got a request Catherine could you turn off screen share and then we'll be able to see us both yeah. better rather than just one one or other okay, uh, let's do that okay. um, thank you oh that's I'm out of presentation road but still sharing mm, that's where my zoom skills have fallen yeah I'm sure See if I can take it off you. And then... There we go. That's fine. That. Yeah. Um, sorry, so back to the questions that have come in. Um, you mentioned about uh, generally wasps being meat eaters, but um, then bees having taken a vegan route. Will meat eating wasps also forage vegan alternatives for protein? If they can't find meat, are they omnivores or will they typically just stick with meat? And they'll typically just stick with meat. They've got, they're honed in to be scavengers. Um, so they've got um, very effective mouth parts for carving off pieces of meat. So they'll, they'll stick with, with what they've, what they know and they've evolved with. So, yeah. Thank you. And in terms of pollination, uh, I love the way this question is phrased. Are bees much more prolific pollinators than wasps, or is that just anti-wasp propaganda? <laughs> Thanks for that, Sam. That's lovely phrasing. So there's actually been some new research that suggests that actually wasps can be much more efficient pollinators than bees, um, basically because bees are kind of hanging on to that pollinate that pollen resource. <laughs> Uh, for their own ends. Um, so there is um, some evidence that wasps are slightly more um, efficient, but I mm. haven't looked enough into that, but mm. uh, it's, it's worth keeping an eye on. 
Thank you. Um, Helen has put a question on. Her daughter would like to know whether wasps were ever a lot bigger at any time in history. <laughs> um, yes. I mean, there's, we've got some considerably big wasps out there at the moment, but but not in this country. So that tar the tarantula wasps, um, they, they do reach kind of hand size dimensions. So um, I'll try not to scare you with that. Now, I'll, I'll confess, and my wife would sound very much in the, the reaction of the person that you put up on the, on the first slide. <laughs> I know it's irrational and I do try and look after wasps, but if they come buzzing around me, I do try and run away. Um, yeah. Do any wasps par parasitise mosquitoes such that could be used for things like malaria control or is that? Ah, I, I don't know that one, actually. It's not something I've I've read about. Um that's a good question. That's fine. I can look into that. Certainly the whole um the hyperparasitism there's there were lots of words in yours that you did a lot better than the hyper hyperparasitism. Yeah, that's, is, um, that's incredible. The webs that form and it again is part of what we would recognise as the benefit of rewilding. Don't try and design that because you could never come up with all no. the relationships that exist. It's um, incredibly generally. complex. Yeah. 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 Um are there any uh, wasp ant or bee species found only in Britain or even only in Yorkshire? Ah, oh, kind of endemic species. Mm. Not, not really. Um, mm. I guess they travel quite well. Yeah, so climate change is, is bringing in quite a lot of other species. So um, that's one to keep an eye on. I mean, in terms of... If you want a good diversity of wasps to look at, I, I suggest um, Southeast England is um, a hot spot. But yeah. That's why we go on holiday to Scotland then. <laughs> so. uh, I recommend uh, Surrey is a, a real hot spot for um, wasps mm. and bees because I used yeah. to work in that area. Okay. Now we've uh, we've had the, the benefit. Of, uh, I suppose a related question is, their impact on wildlife other than people. So we have um, communal sparrow boxes on the house where if one end gets a wasp nest in, as it has the last couple of years, the birds won't use the other two or don't yeah. seem to. There's um, also the arrival of uh, Bombus um, hypnorum, the tree bee, which absolutely love, it absolutely loves nest boxes and that's, that's kind of like it, it's a nesting location of choice so there is that aspect of potentially it's taking out away some nesting resource so in that case I would encourage everybody to put up as many nest boxes and nesting opportunities as yeah. they can. But does it seem just to be in that they're taking up the space or is there evidence they might discourage birds from being in adjacent boxes? But I'm not sure on that front. Um, I don't know how comfortable they are with um, mm. quite a large colony of wasps being next mm. door. Mm. Very empirical at the moment. We we mm. certainly seem to notice they don't uh, they don't stay next door. They might be. I wouldn't a be surprised. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's it for the questions. Um, as I say, a, an amazing depth of knowledge that you have. Um, ridiculous dedication to spend a couple of years in a cave in I forget where you said Malaysia yeah um and and that shows through in the uh in the knowledge that you demonstrated and and really as I say given as much made it greater depth in uh, why we should love all these uh small things particularly the wasps bees and flies um thank you Catherine thanks to John for the intro um as John mentioned that uh, concludes our winter series of webinars for YRN. Uh, our next one is in mid-October uh, with Derek Gow, uh, author of um, Bringing Back the Beaver, and uh, I think probably finished writing now but not yet published a book about looking for wolves and also about birds, beasts and bedlam about his uh, farm down in the southwest. So look out for that. As John said, do sign up for our newsletter. Uh, you're very welcome to join our forum. All the details are on our website. Um, and we just look forward to uh, a wonderful summer of uh, events from our rewilding festival, mostly in June, but spread through the summer, 
as well as uh, a further series of site visits from small to large sites around the region. So do please keep engaged with us. We love to uh, collaborate with other relevant groups. We're doing that more and more. Um, as John mentioned, we'd really appreciate it if you can donate even a little bit. That really helps us both directly and when we apply for grants, that we can evidence the level of support we've got in numbers of donations, not just value. So um, that's really valuable to us, even if you can just give us a little bit. Um, but with that, I'll conclude. Wish you uh, a good rest of the evening and uh, hope you weren't put off your tea by the uh, the few slides that uh, Catherine, in a very restrained manner, showed us. And I'm, I'm sure there are some much more gruesome ones there. But uh, fascinating uh, insight into the worlds of uh, wasps, bees and flies. Thank you again. Thank good you. Night.